Hey, welcome in to Felco Bears Recap Live with Tom Waddle and Olin Krutz. I'm David Kaplan. Bears fall in an absolutely crushing fashion to the Denver Broncos 31-28 on Sunday. Quick turnaround, we get the Washington Commanders on Thursday night. Time for our four seasons, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, and electric game breakdown Okay, Olin, we'll get to the fourth down play in a moment, but what was your take as you watched Justin play for the first three quarters of what turned out to be a crushing loss when they looked so good for so long? Yeah, you you were excited watching him play, watching him work the pocket. Uh, he went through his progression. He was using his eyes to look off the safety. Now, to be honest, when I rewatched the film, I couldn't tell if, if he was just looking off the safety and going back to DJ Moore anyway. So I couldn't tell if he was going through his progression, but that was just his plan. I'm going to look off this safety and go back to the other side. But uh, the movement of the pocket, the running game, the way they tied everything together, uh, I thought Matt Ryan made a good point early on about all the, the times he booted with his back to the line of scrimmage. It did catch it up, up to them eventually, but he couldn't help but be excited, even though it was Denver's defense, Tom, to watch that offense execute at the level they were executing at. Yeah, Olin, I said, and 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 it's not hyperbole, and and I know the bar is low because we haven't had great quarterback play in this town, and it was the Denver defense, but I watched the first three quarters of that game three separate times, and I don't know that I've seen a Bears quarterback play that well for that stretch. Now, you could probably find something, you know, in the past and say, okay – but like he was 23 of 24 with four touchdowns and zero interceptions in the first three quarters. And as you mentioned, the reads were all there. He made all the right decisions. A uh, ball came out on time. And most importantly, like one of the things that I think that has hampered him over the course of his career is I don't think he's been a very accurate quarterback. I, he looked like Aaron Rodgers to me for the first 45 minutes. Every pass was thrown in a position where a wide receiver not only could make the play, but could then make hay after catching the ball, catching it in stride. There were a couple of throws that he made where he was, you know, he had a defender hanging on him. The one that I think stood out to me and one that I think they asked him today up at Hallis Hall that he thought was his best play was the third down throw to to DJ Moore on the slant route where he's taking contact, but at the same time, getting the ball out quick and getting the ball out accurate. So I said to Cat Olin, I said, look, for the first three quarters of that game, it looked like it was played on this day. It was looked like it was played on, let's just say a random Sunday. And the fourth quarter of that game looked like it was played on an entirely different day, like on a Monday or Tuesday, because the player air that occurred in the final 15 minutes is the reason why this team has, you know, still hasn't won a game in the last 14 tries. In the final 15 minutes, you had two turnovers. One of them was returned for a touchdown. You had four penalties and you had an, a handful of mental mistakes that took place that actually kept them from winning this game. So as encouraged as I was by what I saw the first 45 minutes, and it was fun to watch over and over again, you saw the same mistake-prone team and the same, I hate to say it, mistake-prone quarterback play in the final 15 minutes. And until they clean some of that stuff up, we're still going to be looking for our first win and, 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 you know, kind of to put a bow tie on all of this. You know, progress was made in the first three quarters of that game. But somebody said this to me a long time ago, and it resonated with me then, and it resonates with me now. True progress is made in crunch time. And real progress is made when it's time for you to put a team away and win a ball game. And we have yet to see that kind of progress from this team and from Justin, as well as he played for the first 45 minutes. So, Olin, watching some of the mistakes, like, for example, Bears are driving in the fourth quarter and they're trying to milk the clock. Tyler Scott, why I don't know, runs out of bounds. I mean, mm -hmm. just foolish, just foolish yeah. mistakes. Is that coaching? Is that youth? What is that? It's both, right? It's learning how to win. And to Tom's point, you know, there was a point in my career, I thought, like, let's say like 2010, we made it to the NFC Championship game. We had no business being there, right, that year. We weren't very good at all on offense. Our offensive line was not very good at all. But there was a point in my career where it kind of flipped, where I wasn't as good as a player, but we could recognize critical situations and we knew how to win at that time. We knew when it was time to lock in 
and the plays have to be made. And, and that's what learning how to win is. It's performing in critical situations. You see the holdings. You see the false starts, right? You see the mental mistakes on pass protection. You see the mental mistakes by Justin. You see the coaches even getting a little tight, right? Like I was running from Tom. I was wondering why Moore wasn't in the slot in the fourth quarter because he was in the slot through the whole game. And they're motioning him and moving him. And all of a sudden, you leave him in one spot and guess who covers him? Sertan. Sertan's on him the whole time now. So now you have a combined right cap. You have a first-time head coach. You have a first-time offensive coordinator. You have a second-week head coach calling defensive plays. And you have a young team uh, or sur- feels surrounded by his best players are young first- or second-year guys. Of course they don't know how to win. They haven't won. Yeah, watching Justin the first three quarters, I saw really good accuracy, yep. decisiveness. Again, I, you would know better than me. I'm not sure. Is he going through all his progressions? Is he just making really good plays? There were some open receivers, but he was – I thought he threw with conviction. Yeah. That was what I was impressed Well, you know, again, from a receiver's perspective, what you want to do is you want to have the ball thrown, A, in a spot where you can try to make a catch. And I thought I thought the team got a boost, and we can get to the Chase Claypool situation later, but I think the team got a boost from having Darnell Mooney as their second option. Mm-hmm. I think Darnell's a good football player. I don't believe that Darnell will ever be a one. I think his size will keep him from, you know, from being a one long term. But I think Darnell gives that offense something that that Chase Claypool does not. And I think that they were trying to force feed this offense Chase. And when Chase wasn't involved in it and you had DJ as your one and you had Darnell as your two and now your tight ends are involved and Equinemius St. Brown made a really nice catch as well. And you're getting Tyler Scott involved in jet sweeps and some other stuff. Um, I just thought the offense functioned more efficiently and you know, that could have been a byproduct of of, of what the Broncos were doing. Uh, that's fine. But, again, going back to, you know, as a receiver, A, you want the ball put in a spot where you can make a play, and you also want the ball to be put in a spot where you can make a play after the catch. And we have not seen a lot of that. We were dead last in yak, and that was spoke a lot to the lack of talent on the edge. But it also spoke to, you know, to, to have yak. You have to get the ball in the hands of your receivers in a position – where they can actually go with it. And I thought that there were a handful of situations where Justin absolutely dropped the ball in the perfect spot and allowed his guys not only to make plays, but to make a little bit of hay after they made the catch. So, again, I can't say enough. Like, uh, Cap and Nolan, I don't have an agenda in any way, shape, or form. I love this team. I love the organization. I want everyone to do well. I'm going to tell you when things are good, and I'm going to tell you when things are bad. That's the best I've seen him play in his time in a Bears uniform. And again, as I said, I'm not sure I've seen a Bears quarterback play that well. But in the final 15 minutes, he was part of the reason why, a large part of the reason why they couldn't close the door. Yeah, to Tom's point, Cap, like EQ, it could have St. Brown, his grittiness right out there, his blocking. I mean, you've seen him by the pile, knocking guys down, falling down. This is the culture they're talking about. When I watch him play, I don't think they have a culture problem, right? Yeah. Like they, yes. he, when he people, when I watch Mooney play, when I watch Tyler Scott, even though they were trying to put in some of that Dolphins motion, it looked like a sudden motion that they were jumping all sides. Um, they are playing hard. They are trying to block guys. They are getting after people. I watched that film and I thought to myself, they played hard for the coaches, but they don't know how to win, mm-hmm. right? Like, they, like it changed that fast for me, watching EQ out there trying to block guys getting after down the field, uh, Lucas Patrick uh, flying over the pile. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, hey, these guys are playing ball for each other, right? And all you're going to do is put the right guys on the field who want to be out there, who want to play together, who want to win football games. We Let's take a look at Justin Fields' passing numbers today or on Sunday. Uh, and it's called Justin Fields Winging It, brought to you by my friends at West Town Bakery and OK Dispensary, and you could get brunch at the corner of Lake Cook and Milwaukee in Wheeling Food Pastries, specialty coffees, part of the 50-50 restaurant group known for the best wings in the city. OK, 28 of 35, he broke Shane Matthews, yes, Shane Matthews, club record for consecutive completions to start a game, and he had 335 yards passing. And today I watched his whole media session, 
And look, the media is going to eat up what he says, and he's not stupid. But I think he truly believes it when they asked him, do you feel some sense of pride your first 300-yard game? And he said, yeah, it's cool, but guess what? I'd rather throw for 50 yards and three picks and win. I'm trying to get a dub. So it it's the that's right thing to say. I think to, that's who he is. That's hyperbole to a certain degree. But yes, at his core, I do believe that wins are more important to him. But nobody wants to throw three picks and be, you know, 10 of 25. I mean, what you want to do is play well as your team wins also. But, like, I've had no issues with him being accountable for all the things that have gone on. And, and we've talked over the last few weeks, fellas, that the lack of accountability is, is, is shocking in a lot of ways. It's disturbing. And it's what's made this team, from my perspective, I hate to say it because they run through my veins, they've made them unlikable at least at this particular time. So the fact that they, that the quarterback actually does assume responsibility for mistakes. And I think the fact that they finally sat clay pulled down was the first glimmer of somebody being held accountable for not doing their job. So look, they still haven't won a ball game in a year, but hopefully that's coming soon. So Olin, I get a call from a good friend of mine. And he broadcasts in another sport, but one of his dear friends is an assistant with the Broncos. And this buddy of mine calls me and he says, the Broncos know exactly what the Bears are going to do. They think Justin's going to try and run for 100 yards. All they've worked on all week long is we're spying that guy. We've got the right people in place. We're taking the run game away and the Bears will have no answer for us. And Sean Payton, what did he say this week, Tommy? He said, basically, uh, you, you know, we made the wrong decision. They came out throwing it. And so what we decided to do was we would adjust and we would drop back into our zones and force them to play from the pocket. And we knew if we could do that, we'd get one from him. Mm -hmm. what so they, yeah, and, they, they expected it, the run. Yeah, yeah. And, and that interception, uh, you know, Tom will talk to it, speak to it better than I can. But it just seemed like two guys on a different page there. It didn't seem like – I don't know if he made the wrong read there. Cole Komet is one-on-one -on -one with the backup safety, right? And I don't know. Like, he sits it down. I don't know what they're told in practice. I haven't heard if Justin Fields talked about it yet. Maybe you guys have. I don't know if Cole Komet talked about it. The great part about this play, guys, from the protection standpoint is they pick up a blitz. Khalil Herbert comes across and actually picks up a blitzing safety there, and they give him a pocket there to work in. Um, you're right, Cap. Uh, they, they were going to make him beat it. They were mush rushing him sometimes. They weren't coming after him, but he was picking them apart. And even on the last drive when they had stopped to fourth and one, it was third and 10, and he rushed for 20 yards, right? So uh, he was dynamic in that game. At the end of the game, again, it's a young football team. Now, he's not young, and that's what we talk about, him being a multiplier, right? At that moment, when the young guys are struggling, right? When Darnell Wright is holding, when Darnell Wright's going to miss a block, we need you to raise everyone's level up. Take over this game and win the damn game for us and be a franchise quarterback. You know, to go to the interception, and, and if you, you know, listen, if folks don't want to take my word for it, that's totally fine. You won't hurt my feelings. Take the words of a guy who played the position for 17 years, and that's Matt Ryan. And Matt Ryan on the television copy, you can hear him say, once you read that that is a man coverage, you have to throw the football to the outside shoulder. And I think, again, I give Justin a, a ton of credit that after the game and and the day after, he said, look, that's on me. And that particular time, as soon as you read man coverage, you understand you can't. That Justin said, I threw the ball to a spot. You cannot throw a football to a spot in, in man coverage. You throw a football to a spot in zone coverage. And, and again, to Justin's credit, he said, look, what Cole's supposed to do on that is he's supposed to work away from, from the contact. And if you watch the play, Justin throws the ball as if it is a zone route and Cole does what he's supposed to do. And look, I've been critical of Cole and his inability to separate from defenders for two or three years now. I think he's a good kid. I think he, he fills a role. I don't think he's one of these tight ends in 2023 that separates and, and really threatens teams in one-on-one -on -one situations. But with that said, Cole, I thought absolutely ran the right route. You lean on the cornerback or the safety and then you, sort of pivot to the outside. That's how that play is supposed to go in man in man coverage situation. And basically, Justin threw the ball to a spot. You can't throw the ball to a spot in man coverage. You have to allow 
your receiver to work against that man coverage and create some some separation. And that ball, like Matt Ryan said, not Tom Waddle, Matt Ryan said that <laughs> ball in man coverage has to go to the outside shoulder and the ball was actually thrown to a spot. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's a decision and it's a throw that ended what could have been a game tying drive. All right, before we get into Chase Claypool and culture and all that, I want to go to the fourth and one play because mm -hmm. I thought it was an egregious decision. You were hot. You were hot about this. I was. I thought it was one of the dumbest coaching decisions I've seen. <laughs> like, how do you not take the lead? You haven't won in a freaking year. God damn, man. Kick the field goal and force them to have to play from behind. And instead, they're out of the shotgun. They go for it. They, okay, Olin, take us through the blocking mm -hmm. sequence because I watched it a billion times. Darnell Wright is going to help Cole Komet on the right side, and then he has to turn his body and try and get a linebacker who's walked up to the line of scrimmage who blows up the play. Yeah, it's, it's inside zone to the left, right? And the back's aiming point is backside leg of the center. So this is actually inside zone left but the back's aiming point is as downhill as it can be because it is fourth and one and we're just trying to get a first down now uh darnell wright and Cole Komet here they have what's called a c block and if you look at it, a in the a gap b between the guard and tackle c between the tackle and tight end uh that combo block stays on cap no matter where that linebacker is even if darnell wright has to one hand the down guy but the problem he made was you never turn your shoulders on a short yardage situation or the linebacker will fire and hit that gap and hit that hole and get downhill really fast. You have to realize the situation and you can't turn your body to that DN. You just give the tight end a little body presence and then he would actually have to get his right shoulder under the linebacker's chin to dig him out. Just a mistake made here by your rookie right tackle. You know, can I speak to the kind of the overall because Cap, you and I had this conversation as well. And look, yeah. I'm not I'm not tremendously passionate about the decision. Like if you told me you wanted to kick the field goal and then try to keep the the Broncos out of field goal range and then out of the end zone, I'm not gonna yell at you for that. Um, but from a just kind of a a from a perspective, I looked at this game and I saw this Bears team being able to 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 control the line of scrimmage. I saw them run the football effectively. Um, defensively, they couldn't stop a fart, okay? So, like, at that particular time, if I get the fourth and one, mm -hmm. I can – if if I don't end the game by controlling the clock, at the very least, I'm going to control that clock until 30 seconds. So, not only have you been moving the ball well, but you have an opportunity – if in fact you convert the fourth down, you may be able to end the game. All right. Mm -hmm. If you kick the field goal, you are giving the ball back to Russell Wilson with two minutes and 55 seconds. And he's going to take, uh, you know, his offense to the line of scrimmage against a defense that hasn't been able to stop anybody. So to think if, if, if you had Olin's defense mm -hmm. back in the day, or you had one of the in a second, kick it. You kick it, and then you move the defense. Like, listen, if Dan Hampton and Steve McMichael and Richard Dent are running out there after mm -hmm. you take a three-point lead, I'm all in. But when oh, this you, don't, yeah, you don't even have to kick it, Tom. They'll get you the ball back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See, I, I was interested because people were saying, well, you did that because you don't believe in your defense. Well, there's still two minutes and 50 seconds left with two timeouts. Maybe you do it because you do believe in your defense. But here, to me, the bigger point was – it was for me, it was like a culture moment. I just, I hope they went to Justin Fields and said, What play do you want? Right. Because, because at some point, you want to take this team and you want Tom, like you know, and, and Cap, you know this too. You got to give it to the players. They got to take ownership of this team. Correct. That's Especially a moment the right there. Yeah, it's a moment right there to say, Justin. Yeah. And, and I tweeted out about when uh, Harbaugh did that with Lamar Jackson in 2019. Yep. Yep. And he said, what do you want to run? Do you want to go for it? He said, hell yeah, coach. And they ran quarterback power. Right now, they gave Justin a chance to keep that ball, and he didn't. Yeah, like, That was the inside zone read. He didn't keep it. He, he made uh, what he thought was the right read there. But 
I don't know if anybody talked about that play. I hope they did on the TV copy. TV copy I just saw him talking to Janoko. I hope Getsy and Eberflus walked to him and said, what do you think here? What do you want to do? What play do you want to run? Because this is your team, young man. Okay, okay the Owen, other thing. That point, too. I, I told Cap, and I pointed it out to Cap after watching the play several times. And you would know this better than I from, from being an offensive lineman and, and being in the trenches. I can make a case, and I'm not being overly critical because I understand why he made the decision that he made. But with that as the backdrop, where you want your quarterback, who's had the best game of his life at least for for the first three quarters of it, I think you can make a case, and people make you know think I'm being an asshole about it, and it's not what I wanted. That's not how I'm trying to project this. But if you look at the film, I think there's a really good chance if Justin keeps that ball, he beats number zero. Not only to the edge, but he also gets to the first down mark pretty quickly because he's that phenomenal of an athlete. And I kind of, after watching it several times, and again, it's, it's, it's hindsight. I was a little disappointed that he didn't keep that ball and make that play on his own. You know what I'm saying? I I would, I would love for him to keep it. And even if he doesn't make it, I'd still love for him to keep it because I'd love for him to say, I want the ball in my hands in this critical situation. And, and, And I totally agree with you there. Um, probably would have ran him downhill and just, they ran quarterback power and got stopped. I think it's Green Bay a couple of years ago, but um, it's just at that moment, I want to run a play that Justin wants to run. I mean, we're 0-4. My biggest job, my biggest responsibility to this coaching staff is to give this team to this young man and see if he can win us football games and eventually win us a Super Bowl. Yeah. So, Tommy, I was with Olin earlier and I asked him and we have you know, the pictures that we had, we could put back up. And I said, why does Robert Tunyon, number 18, not go out and hit number zero? And he said, because in that set, Olin, you told me you're going to leave that guy unblocked, correct? You go down and get the next level. That's who they're reading, right? They're reading that guy. He's going to bluff, bluff, release outside, and he'll lead block for Fields if that guy bites. And that's the guy they're reading. So Fields, uh, he's looking at him. If, if he looks at Fields, he's going to hand the ball off. Yeah, the, like the end, the guy at the end of the line of scrimmage is the responsibility of the quarterback. The same exact responsibility in the 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 boot that was turned into a, a sack fumble. And there were a lot of people asking, "Well, why don't you block that guy?" Well, the play is designed that that guy is left unblocked, and and that's part of the play. And the quarterback actually makes the decision based on that. I thought it was really interesting too, Olin, that. You know, I thought Matt Ryan did a lot of good things describing some of the quarterback stuff. And I thought Tiki Barber was really sharp, too, when he pointed yeah, out. they were awesome together, man. I really thought – I enjoyed the game. Yeah, they were and, – yeah. and and I wondered how you felt about it. I thought Tiki made it such a great point that the defenses have adapted to some of the shit that they've seen recently, especially from the Bears. And nobody is crashing hard at the end of the line of scrimmage. Everyone's staying at home – and forcing him to give the ball to the running back, or as soon as they see him turn their his back in one of these fakes, they beeline to him. And I think Tiki's point was, now that teams have adjusted to what they've done in the past, you can no longer have your quarterback turn his back in boots. We saw it in the opening game of the season, I think, too, against Green Bay, where someone came off the edge and absolutely destroyed him on a first down, and they find themselves in second and twenty five. So maybe going forward, make the adjustment that you could still run the boot, but you got to run the boot with the quarterback front facing. Yeah, and, so, and earlier in the game, they ran a boot cap and a blasting game cut the end, right? Yeah. So you can also leave the fullback in to cut that guy and or seal that guy. But, you know, to the bigger point to me is, and obviously you go back and you watch the film and you're going to break it down. You'll be very critical after a loss like that. You know, like like – I, I like to look at like little things like what can we actually do to win this game? And I would just say to Justin, Justin, man, when you are faking this like you and you don't have the ball, you need to give us an all out fake. Yeah. They need to believe you have the ball, right? You need to run to that corner hard like you have the ball. And then you may hold a few other guys because he is our scariest weapon. Now, and I think you heard them. We talked about last week on the show that Herbert is really close. He's close to breaking one arm tackle and going to the house, right? And you heard all of a sudden announcers say that. We all know what happens with announcers. 
they meet with these coaches. Yeah. And that's where they get everything from. So if you're a listener of our show, listen to the announcers because the coaches behind closed doors give them everything about what they think. The announcers are really giving you the coach's point of view. And they said they think Herbert can do a little better. And he can, he's like, he make dynamic plays, the explosive plays for them. Herbert's getting dropped, guys, by safeties on the spot. Yes. They're getting him to a safety because Fields is holding guys. The whole line is blocking. They got him to a safety against Denver, and it's, the Denver had backup safeties in, and they were dropping him on the spot he got to. You expect your running back to beat that safety. Yep. We're going uh, zero sugar cherry tonight. That's why you get uh, 23 reps of chin-ups, Cap. <laughs> I was doing chin-ups at Olin's house today, Tommy. How about that? Tommy, uh, and, and his bicep is still on a milk carton somewhere. Hey, listen, I'm not doing a chin-up unless there's a, an alcoholic <laughs> beverage up high that I need to go reach. Whatever it takes, right? Whatever yeah, I can't takes. get my hands over my, heads, my head these days. <laughs> so the fourth and one fails again. I was furious. Furious. You were. You were I, w- I was beat red. You called me, and you were so mad you wanted somebody fired immediately. I said, Olin, if I was the GM, my owner would have to tell me why I can't fire this coach in Soldier Field. Did you see poor uh, Jeff King, the uh, player personnel there in the, in the suite, swearing into his hands? He was all of us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's, my. it's been tough, man. It's, it's a lot of losing. Uh, but like I said, I, I don't, I don't mind that decision there as long as it was, it was for to give your quarterback the team. I agree. Uh, the Duke eight one one says, "Holy crap, is this a regular thing?" Cap Waddle Olin breaking it down. Subscribe, okay? If you were betting your own money on it, if we lose ugly on Thursday, is Eberflus cleaning out his office Friday morning, or they let him keep coaching? I don't think so. I, I mean, who's going to take over? You know, I told like, you, you pick up the phone and call Lovey Smith and wow. go, dude, I need Olin, you to come in and be my DC. I don't have one. Not, and then as Olin, Holmes, you know, I tell him, listen, when I fire defer. this guy, you're getting the interim. I'm going to defer to Olin very quickly here. You know Lovey better than I. Why on God's green earth would Lovey take that job? Because he's walking back in the building going, you guys ran me out of here. And guess what? You still need me. Yeah, I, I don't think they do anything like that, but it's interesting, right? Because you talk about the strength of staff, and Tommy said, who takes over for him? And then you look at this Washington Red, uh, Commanders, no, I say Redskins, Commanders coming, uh, uh, the next game coming up, and you look at their staff, right? You tell what well, Ron Rivera uh, ever had a year like Eberflu as well. Uh, there's Del Rio, there's the enemy. Uh, yeah. There's guys you could immediately say, why would you just let them take over? Yeah. You open – chicagobears.com and look at the Bears coaching staff and you say, man, I'll keep Eberflus. Thank you very much. So a guy right now, Cap, uh, to come in and, and run everything new and then for, the, for players to listen to you out of nowhere and earn NFL players respect. And that would just be, man, you're just, you're just tanking for the first <laughs> second pick, which it looks you know, like they're doing anyway. Yeah. Let me add this too. And I'd love to get Olin's take on it. Look, um, you're still developing guys. This is year two of this regime, okay? And I'm not making a case for keeping the coaching staff long-term, but what I am making a case for is some young players need some sense of, of stability, whether it's the guy that you think can get you to the top of the mountain or not. Like Darnell Wright is, is a good football player. Like what he needs is stability. There are other guys in that building that don't need a lack of stability. Um, could they be developed to a greater degree over the course of time by a different group? Maybe so, but I wouldn't ask this group that's already faced a ton of adversity to face more adversity by having to listen to somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know that you want to do that with some of your young players that you do have really high hopes for. All right, we're going to take our time out. We'll come right back because I want to talk Chase Claypool. We'll get more on Eberflus, and we'll get you ready for the Washington Commanders game after this. Mark, a little help here? Keep it down. The noise is making them angry. Whoa. 
Hey, I'm not a beekeeper, but I can replace these windows fast. Felco will be here for your home renewal needs. Right now, buy one window and you'll get one free. Plus, no interest until 2025. And we'll get it done Felco fast. Buy one window, get one free, and soon. Hurry. Call now. Call 866 for Felco. No. Our Felco Bears Recap Live is brought to you by Felco. Chicago's home renewal experts call 866-4-FELCO. Four seasons, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, and electric. For all the right reasons, four seasons. Vienna Beef. Go to ViennaBeef.com and use code CAP23. That's K-A-P-23 at checkout for 15% off your order today. And Dr. Pepper. Grab an ice cold, refreshing Dr. Pepper today at a McDonald's near you. All right, I want to get into Chase Claypool. Chase Claypool is away from the team. Iberflus, I thought, embarrassed himself on Sunday after the game. I know his head's spinning. He just lost a tough one. He's lost 14 straight. Coach, did you guys tell Chase not to be here? Uh, it was a choice. Uh, when did you tell him? Uh, this morning. Turns out it was Saturday that he's got to come back and the PR staff has to correct it. Then he was on with me and Jonathan Hood on ESPN 1000. He said, can I set the record straight? We told him on Saturday and I'll give you this. We've told him not to come back in the building this week. Uh, there's no way you're bringing him back in next week, right, Olin? Listen, if the Bears third down defense is 32nd in the league, their PR media area is 33rd in the league, okay? So I'm going to tell you right now, Eberflus, yeah, I'm sorry. And I know every, people hate me in that building anyway. Eberflus now, Cap, he just coached a football game. You're the PR department. You're Ryan Pose them. You get down there and give him information about what's going on. Look, we asked him, we asked him to stay away. Or, or what, what, you have to be in front of this. That is your job. Yeah. You have to be in front of these questions that are about to be asked by the media in Chicago, which ranks maybe number one in analyzing the, the football team in the NFL. I told you I went to New Orleans, just a shock that there was no media there at all, right? This is Drew Brees and the boys. No one's even covering them, okay? So I, I, I don't blame that so much on the ball coach, right? He's a football coach. I, I am tired of talking about Chase Claypool. I don't even know what the hell to say about that guy. He's not good enough to talk about, right? I, I, don't, that. I don't hate Chase Claypool. Uh, look, he's, you're just – I turned a film on. We knew week one he shouldn't be here. That's Correct. on Ryan Poles. That's not on Eberflus. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more there. Like, look, I think that th there's a certain degree – he's focused on coaching a football team, and I'm not suggesting that he has handled the situation well, but he needs to be coached up on what the temperature in town is and what people are thinking and what people are saying. Thank you. But yep. to – to the Chase Claypool issue, um, like, look, I and and I don't blame the media at all for asking all of these questions. Oh. Um, if you open the door and you allow them to ask you 20 questions, then they're going to ask you 20 questions. With that mm -hmm. said, if I was them, I would have said, look, we haven't won a football game this year. We haven't won a football game in our last 14 times we have trotted out there. He's not even with us right now. This is a distraction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you very briefly the situation and then we're going to move on. And if you have any other questions about transactional issues, ask the general manager because he's in charge of all of that. But right now I got to find a way to coach the guys that are in my locker room and get them ready to play a Washington team that is very competitive. I told you guys after week one, he wouldn't be getting nearly the number of snaps in week two that he got in week one. I wouldn't have tolerated what I saw. Now, I will also be honest with you. His effort in week two and week three was significantly better. So I had no issue with Chase Claypool's effort in weeks two and three. I have to be 100% honest with you on this front as well. He's not good enough to be sweating this shit the way that everybody is sweating it. Agreed. He's, he's not cap. He's not. He doesn't play to his size. He doesn't play to his speed. He doesn't separate, you know. I don't know what has happened to him over the course of time, but all I would encourage people to do is put on the film and you tell me what he is doing so well that you can't live without him. And I'll tell you that that answer to that question is nothing.
And that's Can why I, I said to you guys, he has a bullshit hits principle. What he did embarrassed the team and the organization in the Green Bay game. He should never have been on that freaking plane to Tampa. Cap, if you just go on ChicagoBears.com, there's no less than 30 people involved in digital media, social media, media. Like, the, 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 the social media people, they did not see Twitter. did not see these questions coming, right? Get to the head coach. Talk to him about it. And here's the thing, Cap, for the – for people to believe in the head coach's hits principle, everybody in the building needs to back him up. Yes. They got to back his play. And if the people above him don't back his play, the hits principle means shit. Yeah. I would say this too. They gave way too much well oxygen to this point. Way too much oxygen. Like I said, like he wasn't even in uniform. He wasn't in the building. There was no reason that they spent any time on him other than, listen, He's not with the team right now. If you have any question about what the, the you know the future of his status with the Chicago Bears is, ask the front office. Right now, I haven't done a good enough job getting us ready to play on Sundays. He's not even with us. I'm focused on the Washington Commanders, and 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 thank you for the questions. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the fact that that press conference went on for 15 or 20 minutes to me was. Was, embarrassing uh, like would he have been out of his purview i thought he should have a little stronger than what tommy said if that was me standing up there listen to me he's not here he's at home for a very specific set of reasons i'll answer anything else you want i'm done talking about chase claypool are we you. clear I, and I, you I, ask I, me I, again this media session is over Cap, I'll do you one better. How about somebody go out in front of Coach Eberflus and said he is not answering questions about Chase Claypool today? Bingo. Since since they're all making money there, right? Since everyone's getting paid to be media people in that building, why don't we act like it? It's a great point. All right, time for our Dr. Pepper player of the game and play of the game. Dr. Pepper, get a Dr. Pepper refreshing and delicious at a McDonald's near you. Our player of the game, still got to give it to our guy, number one, Justin Fields, 28 of 35 for 335, four touchdown passes, his best game passing as a professional, just couldn't finish it off to get a victory. So uh, Justin Fields is our recap player of the game. Our play of the game, I mean, it's hard to go any other direction. It's got to be the fourth down play. It, it, that that's got to be one of them, and then I thought the uh, the Russell Wilson pass, the strip sack. We could go a number of ways. I ended up choosing the Justin Fields strip sack because well, it tied Cap, the game. Cap, I will. I'll say this: we had this d discussion on the air yesterday. You know, I mean, look, we're all expecting the worst, and, and and regardless of how well things are going, there's a pessimism that permeates all of us at this point because we've seen nothing but but badness over the course of time. I felt really good about this game until that play. And I thought that was the play that really changed the momentum in the game. Then I start, I, I thought I saw indecision in the quarterback's play. I thought it gave obviously life to the Denver Broncos. I didn't think there was any doubt that that was the key play of the game. And again, are you asking a lot of your quarterback in that difficult situation to make, you know, a, a good decision? Yes, you are. But as Olin said earlier, that's what these guys are paid to do. They're asked to, to, to lift the, the performance of everyone else, and they're asked to provide solutions. At the very least, you have to protect the football like it's one of your children. And under no circumstances – even if a defensive lineman is in your grill and you weren't expecting him, you have to secure the football. And unfortunately, that did not take place. Olin, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I, that play, obviously, that play, that quick, you know, that quick seven right there, that, that was deflating for the Chicago Bears. Um, you know, I, I will say this when I rewatched the film, it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, as you guys know. Uh, I coach up there at Carmel Catholic and all game. I'm asking guys when, before we run our boot, what they were running there, what's this specific defensive end doing 
somebody watched the backside. What defensive end should we run it at? So I went back and I watched the game like that. And Benito was the one guy when he was backside, he was running at the quarterback every time. Right. So I, I just, I, you know, some, some parts of me feel like the play calling there, you shouldn't have boot, boot into that guy. Now they do flip their, their outside linebackers and that is tough to do. But um, that play right there, obviously, is a play that gave them a whole bunch of momentum to win that football game late there. Right. But uh, I think the best play of the game I thought I saw from Fields was that boot where he hit Herbert. I thought that was magic, man. I thought he when he juked out that defensive end and threw that ball in there. I don't know Herbert's in his read there. Uh, down a goal line, uh, like Tom saying, man, for three quarters, uh, that guy was doing everything you could ask from him. I would say too, like again, I reference what Tiki Barber said during the game. Maybe going forward, you have to eliminate the plays where the quarterback is turning his back to the defender because the league has made adjustments to what they're doing, and the last thing you want to do is find your quarterback in that situation again going forward. This is at the very least the second time I've seen it in four games and it may have happened more frequently than that, but I did see it against green Bay in week one. And obviously to me, it changed the entire momentum of the game uh, on Sunday. Did Cap, you- let me jump in here. Real- Cap, let me jump in here real fast and just say this. Now we, I don't know like what aiming point Fields is supposed to get to, right? Like, like it's easy to blame Getsy. Um, it's easy to say the play is not good. It's not terrible. Like, I don't know. Like what, where is he supposed to go? Did he get, far enough away from that backside is did he get enough depth when he came out of the fake all those little details like when you watch this team and like you guys know in the nfl winning games late the guys who practice the details on monday wednesday thursday friday those are the teams that win and they don't let it slip they say no i'll run that play again because you're not doing it right right so i don't know on that play like where is he supposed to get to on the handoff Did he get far enough away from the defensive end? Did he loop deep enough so when he does turn around, because like you guys know, if you turn around too shallow, then that DN is in your face immediately. Yeah. So if you look at what they're doing offensively, I went back and charted like the last 15, 16, 17, 18 plays. I keep counting them up. Wait, if you charted them, Cap, what number did you chart? No, I kept adding to that number. Oh, I, got I got to you, like got 20 you. plays. I got you. I got you. No designed runs. Like, just, like For all him. of a sudden, we took ju- the ball out of Justin's hands. He took the snap. Here's Khalil Herbert, a little Roshan. Well, well, Cam, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. First of all, Sean Payton told you at the end of the game, it's what they were defending. Like, that was their singular goal was we were going to take the design runs away from him. And when you saw one or two of them, they went nowhere. And by the way, they were moving the ball effectively. Khalil Herbert was running the ball. They were throwing it down the field. They even incorporated a couple of jet sweeps that were positive plays. Like, there was nothing wrong with how they were moving the ball down the field for the majority of the game. Player execution errors got them beat in the end. I, 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 I'm passionate about, like, could they have done something somewhat different? Fine. Maybe so. But they came out in the second half. The first drive of the third quarter was a nine-minute drive that they yeah. took to the end zone. Okay, you the know, next drive you had a three and out. That happens. Even good offenses. Pat Mahomes takes three and out sometimes. The next drive, you went first and ten. You got a good gain on the sec- or first play. You were second and three. You got the first down, first and 10. You got a good game. You were second and three. You got the first down. You're first and 10. You get sacked for a strip sack and the ball goes the other direction. Like they were still moving the football. So like, I think, you know, the the ebbs and flows of a football game, you know, an offensive coordinator has to be on his toes, but like, I don't look at that game and say, well, in the second half, what did you, what would you guys do? Okay, you could have tweaked some shit, but at the end of the day, you were still having success against the Denver Broncos doing what you were doing. Yeah, and and in that long drive, the the thing that amazed me was just going back here on ESPN was how they overcame like a second and eighteen, and they overcame like like that. This offense, even though that we keep saying we don't know how bad this Denver defense is, and the Bears defense ain't like we talk about the offense because it's fields, but uh, the defense just gave them touchdowns late in the game, but the 
you know, they were overcoming second and 18. They were overcoming all false starts. They were overcoming sacks. And Justin Fields just kept making play after play. And then something just happened, uh, like Tom keeps saying, in that fourth quarter where it's like, man, where is that execution, right? Uh, like, Darnell Wright got that holding call. You remember late in the game, right? Yep. The thing that bugs me, guys, is they ran that um, jet sweep. I forget who it was on the same it was drive. Tyler Scott. Tyler Scott. He, he, was holding, he grabbed, he grabbed uh, Gregory on that play, too, and held him. Darnell Wright needs to, like, somebody needs to sit down and say, like, you got to get your hands inside, man. You got to stop grabbing guys on the outside. You can grab guys. I, I want to be clear here on holding. You can grab guys. You just can't prevent them from going where they want to go. So you can clamp them up, right? But if he goes to run this way, you can't pull them back. That's holding. That's what people are confused about what holding is and what it isn't. That's why sometimes you see guys holding guys and the holding doesn't get called. You can't change the direction of where they want to go. All right, time for our Vienna Beef Eye on the Opponent. And let's take a look at the Washington Commanders. I'm happy to announce my partnership with Vienna Beef this year. Great taste and flavor since 1893. Celebrating their 130th anniversary, look for one of my favorite kits, the Chicago-style hot dog kit. Perfect for any tailgate or game day. Go to ViennaBeef.com. Use code CAP23 at checkout for 15% off your order today. Perfect for your football-watching parties, especially you Chicagoans who moved away. All right, let's talk about some of the top guys we're going to have to contend with. Terry McLaurin is a beast. Chase Young on the defensive side. Let's start on the offensive side. You got Sam Howell, a young quarterback. Brian Robinson, a running back. Um, Terry McLaurin is as good a wide receiver as there is. So, Tommy, you take the offensive side first. How do you stop them with a banged-up Eddie Jackson if he even goes? Probably no Jalen Johnson. And we can't sack the quarterback. Yeah, I, look, it's it's a dilemma. I mean, they're, they can't stop anybody. Uh, it's the reason why you know, and I yelled at each other on Sunday. Like I, I had no problem with them going for it on fourth down because I have more faith in their offense than I do on the, with their defense at this at this time. I just want them. I want you to go down swinging. Like if you can't pressure the quarterback with four, bring five. And if you can't pressure the quarterback with five, bring six. And I got it. You're playing backup defensive backs, but go down taking your best shot. Um, it's going to be a handful for them. Like, look, say, you know, they're not a juggernaut for, for in terms of an offense. They've scored a lot of points. They scored points against Philadelphia this past weekend. They scored points a couple of weeks ago. Like, they can, they can move the ball when they need to. They're not going to make you forget about the Kansas City Chiefs, but they've got some guys out on the edge. They're going to score. It, I think it just it comes down to whether or not the Bears are going to be able to, to put – put a number on the scoreboard against the Washington defense. Okay. Yeah, so stop this offense. You, you have to get out field on third down, right, Cap? Yeah. They, they got to get pressure for somewhere, man. I mean, even thinking outside the box and going to like a 3-3-5 three, three, and bringing Noah Sewell on the field and getting your safeties like Briskers involved in some kind of blitzes and screwing up their identification. We keep talking about it. I would go to Billings, Justin Jones, Yannick Ngakwe, bring on three linebackers and start walking guys around because I got to find pressure from somewhere. Yeah. So – Explain to me then, Olin, how you handle Duran Payne and Chase Young and Montez Sweat. Like, we talked last week and you said to Tommy and to me, yeah, I'm not as concerned about the interior of Denver as I was with Kenny Clark or uh, Vita Vea. How do you handle this Washington front four? Because they're a beast. You ever seen uh, John Wick? They called John Wick Baba Yaga, right? The boogeyman. And the boogeyman... Yeah. They face one boogeyman. This team's got four. They got four monsters up front there, man. And we don't have, as of yet, a dominant offensive lineman. Now, they did leave Darnell Wright by himself a lot against the Denver Broncos and chipped a lot for Borum. But against these guys, it's almost like everybody needs a chip cap. You got to run the ball downhill, man. You got to run downhill. You got to be stubborn with it. You got to protect your young quarterback. And then when you do get him on the move, you got to seal the edges for him. So he can get out there. They got to use a little more blockers in their boot concept. And hopefully, like the Denver Broncos, they drop guys all over the place that are running those crossing routes uh, uh, in the middle of the field and give him half-field reads, get the ball out, screen, sprint right, sprint left, uh, run these things that really protect your quarterback. The only problem is, like you guys know, 
to run an offense like that, you got to have a good defense and a good special teams. And for the Bears, when you look at them, you don't see any of that stuff. You know, I'll okay. say this to you guys as well, real quick. I think this is one of the more intriguing games in recent history for this Bears franchise and this coaching staff and this quarterback. Because we're going to find out if some of the fantastic things that the quarterback and the offensive coordinator designed and all of that that transpired in the first three quarters of this game. Now, again, they didn't close the deal. And, and as I said earlier, true growth and real, real progress occurs in crunch time. But can you go to Washington against a more stout defense and build on some of the really good things that we saw on Sunday? Or are we all going to be sitting around on Friday saying, well, that was all more a product of Denver being a horseshit defense than it was our offense actually finding answers to the questions. And I think that good point. That, 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 that this game, for me, is the most intriguing game of the entire season after the Green Bay game to, to open the season. Who are you? What we saw for the first 45 minutes against the, the, the Denver Broncos, was that more about you and your quarterback, or was it more about the inefficiencies and the ineffectiveness of the Denver defense? You're going to step up in class against the Washington Commanders. They've given up points, but they're a more stout defense. Can you do some of the same things and have success against them the same way you did against an inferior Denver Broncos defense? Or are we going to be sitting around next week at this time saying to ourselves, well, we went right back to where we were before, and the, the, it was more a product of a bad defense the week before? Hey, Olin, how, what do you do? Tevin Jenkins, uh, Luke Getze said today when he met the media, we think we have a chance to have Tevin back in the lineup on Thursday night. His window to be activated is open. Uh, if he comes back, he's at left guard. Larry Borm's at left tackle. Darnell Wright's at right tackle. I assume Nate Davis is going to be at right guard. Who's at center, Cody Whitehair or Lucas Patrick? Cody Whitehair goes back to center, right? You, you try to get to your original plan. Nate Davis now, uh, there were still communication issues, but I thought his feet got under him late in that second half, and I can see why they gave him a little bit of money to play that right guard spot. The man can bend, and he can root guys out in the run game. So uh, they, they have to work more together. There were some mental mistakes in there, him leaving too early on pass protection when Lucas thought he was going to be there, him not being fitting in quite correctly with Darnell Wright on double teams. The more he's in there, I think you'll see them improve. Get Cody White here in there at center. Tevin Jenkins, we've all seen when he plays. He's a big, good, physical offensive lineman now. Excited to see him back on the field. Hope they don't bring him back too early because he's shown that he, he doesn't put a lot of games in a row. By that, I mean he is susceptible to injury. You make sure this guy's 100% healthy. You make sure he's ready to go because you want him for the rest of the year because if Braxton can come back, we're starting to see a little bit, guys. We're starting to see flashes now of what Ryan Pose's original plan was. I got to be honest with you. As Darnell Wright and Nate Davis get a little bit better, I can imagine Cody Wright or Tevin Jenkins and Braxton, pretty good offensive line. So for people that are super down on the Bears' plan at offensive line, you see potential growth as this thing comes together. If those guys stay healthy, right? I'm, I was down on their plan too. Like, you know, I was down on their plan because I didn't think Tevin Jenkins ever showed you could play healthy. I thought they needed more assets. I don't think they have a true center on the roster. Now, Lucas Patrick plays some center. To me, he's more of a backup swing center guard. And then Cody White here does, it has it. I mean, two or three staffs have moved him out of center already, guys. That tells you this man doesn't want to be center. He wants to be manning the left guard spot. So, but when he comes back, he can't play a little center. The communication, the snap will change again. But if they can, their plan, if these guys can stay healthy, if Darnell Wright can develop, if Nate Davis will stay out there on the field, these guys can play decent football together. But that's a lot of ifs. I would say this too, Cap. Uh, you know, I'm not in the business of selling hope, especially for a team that has struggled the way they have. But I think Olin makes such a great point that, Look, they haven't had their starting offensive line for one single game this year. They just haven't. I mean, it, it's been it's been difficult for them to find any type of of, of cohesion and, and 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 there's just no rhythm there. They're secondary. Everybody's been banged up as well. I just personally, I want. I'm not telling you. I think that this team can contend for anything, 
But I want to see some of these guys, young guys, play. I want to see them get healthy, whether it's Jalen Johnson or it's Kyler Gordon or or Eddie Jackson to get back involved or, or you know, some of their offensive linemen. I think they're a better football team than we've seen the first four games. I think that there are some young guys that you can grow with going forward. They've just – a lot of guys have been so banged up and so hurt that it's just accentuated the negative to this point. Do you feel like they – They've lost 14 in a row, for Christ's sake. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. But do you feel like they got a chance to beat Washington? Uh, not on the road, I don't. Not without a pass rush and not with Washington's defensive line. I don't feel like they have a chance. Uh, they'd have to luck in the takeaways like we keep talking about. Uh, Washington's offense scores a lot of points in the fourth quarter. I think they'll get used to the uh, Bears' defense. And without the pass rush, without the D-line, the, the two guys, guys, who, like, when you see promise, you see hope. The two guys we got to start seeing promise and hope from are uh, Dexter and Pickens. Yeah. Those are the two guys that's got to start flashing for us somewhere. I haven't seen them flash at all yet. And that, to me, I see flashes out of Darnell Wright, Tom. I see flashes out of offensive line. And like you said, I see Mooney. I see more. I see Fields playing good. Looking for someone on that defensive line, some young player that I can buy stock in. Well, it's uh, – Tommy, make your prediction. Um, listen, I can't pick this team as much as I want to. I can't pick them to win until I see them win. And that may sound like, you know, elementary, but until I see them find a way to put another team away and how they learn – until they learn how to win a football game, how can I actually pick them against a team that's better at the line of scrimmage? I, at this point, I can't. I think that – you know, they can make progress and they can be very competitive in these games. But I think it'd be premature to start predicting Bears victories until you actually see it happen once. And then then they start to build a little momentum. So, no, I, I, I think it'll be a close game. I don't think Washington will run away from them. But at this point, I don't think that I'm comfortable picking them to win a football game. You said last week you lose to Denver at home. It's rock bottom. Olin, have they hit rock bottom yet? Yes, yes, they have. Last week, when Denver came back with that defense, with how well they played in three quarters, when 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 they got that sack fumble and they got stopped on that fourth and one, that was rock bottom for this team, man. And they got to they got to pull themselves up because they're right. Nobody believes in them. Like if they're mad at all of us, and this old and crude guy, this old center, this balding center, he doesn't even look like a center anymore. It looks like he has cancer. Keeps talking bad about us. Wow. Uh, like, look. Like, <laughs> uh, they're right. I don't believe in them. No, how can you? Tommy just told you they haven't won, man. Yeah. Okay. I, like, like they have to take chances on special teams. They got to get Trent Taylor off, off the kick puncher. Who cares if you fumble? We got to get some big plays, man. You got to go block a punt. You got to kick it onside. You got to go for a win. You know, Olin, I say this all the time. I say, and it sounds so simple. You change the narrative by changing the narrative. That means you go out there and you beat that other team, and you play better than you've played to this point. I, look, there's nothing I want more than to talk positively about my favorite football team. So make me start talking positively about you. And, and I can't talk positively about you until you prove to me and everybody else that loves this team so very much that you're capable of winning a football game. So make me change how I feel about you, please. All right, last you know, thing. You no know, cap. When you turn it on, you're like, man, you want to say like Tommy's saying, like Brisker, man. Brisker looked pretty good in that game. Yeah, they're blitzing him off the edge. He's pretty physical. Darnell Wright looked pretty good. Nate Davis. I thought, you know, you want to say all those things, but they lose, so you can't. Yeah. All right. Biggest key. Well, give me one key, Olin. Yeah, the running game against this defensive line is going to be the key on the road with the crowd noise. You do not want to be in third and long. You want to stay ahead of the chains. You got to run the ball, and you got to have an extension of your run game. By that, I mean rolling fields out and getting the ball out fast. Tommy, one key. Yeah, I think you've got to control the 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 time of possession here, like, uh, and you do that by converting third downs. You've got to be good on first down. Don't put yourself in second and long. Uh, you just can't leave that defense out there for more than half the game. They're not equipped to stopping anybody at this point. So I would say you got to be much better on third down. You got to control the clock and. And give your defense a, a little bit of a break. Give them a help. Gentlemen. Cap, one key, Cap. One key. One key from me? Yes. You cannot 
turn the football over. You've That's got fair. to take care of the fair. football. That's fair. Low hanging fruit, Cap. That's a low hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> just in case you're wondering, man. I'm just saying that was not that was not, that was not a lot of critical thinking there. There was not. Absolutely not. <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes keeping it simple is the best path. It's the best way, man. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Guys, have a great rest of your week. I'll see you next Tuesday. Hopefully, we're talking about a victory. Mm. Oh, please. Thank you, guys, man. <laughs> All, All right. right. And make sure you head on out to Westtown, corner of Lake Cook in Milwaukee, the Westtown Bakery in Wheeling. They've got the OK Dispensary Cafe and Lounge there. It's a great spot. Get yourself brunch. Bears are playing Sunday. Get up. Have a delicious brunch. They got awesome coffee drinks. Westtown Bakery. A brand new awesome spot in Wheeling at the corner of Lake Cook and Milwaukee. For Tommy, for Olin, I'm Cap. Thank you for watching Feldco Bears Recap Live. Hopefully we'll be talking about a win next week. Thank you for watching. And tell your friends, subscribe to the Recap channel on YouTube. Take that. Feldco Bears Recap Live is brought to you by Feldco, Chicago's home renewal experts. Call 866-4-FELDCO. Four Seasons Heating, Air Conditioning, Plumbing, and Electric. For all the right reasons, Four Seasons. Vienna Beef. Go to ViennaBeef.com and use code CAP23. That's K-A-P-23 at checkout for 15% off your order today. And Dr. Pepper. Grab an ice-cold, refreshing Dr. Pepper today at a McDonald's near you.